Everything in Seven Stories by Andy Jones. Narrated by the author. Story 5. The Next Stage. Part 1. Though the tiredness was clouding his vision, there was no mistaking the ugly, piercing green LED light from the clock on his car's dashboard. It was 3.39 a.m. Dr. Phil Waters had put the air on full and cold to wake himself up, but less than two minutes later realised this was a bad idea. It was a frosty night and he needed a blast of cold air like he needed a smack in the face. His car had been pushing 65 most of the way there, and it wasn't long before he passed the old sign pointing out that the ETRU was two miles ahead. He was nearly at work. Nine in the morning was his usual clocking on time, but today it was going to have to be an early start. And an early start for no good reason too. The ETRU was the Extraterrestrial Research Unit in Colorado, a federally funded center hidden away from anywhere important. It wasn't a secretive organization. Many conspiracy theorists, nuts and UFO enthusiasts loved the place and would often camp out, but this wasn't Area 51. Nothing much exciting ever happened here. Its funding was, Waters didn't like to admit, perfectly adequate for the kind of work they did. It wasn't a huge sum by any means, but they didn't need huge sums of money. Their job was to simply track any signals or interpret any data that appeared to originate from somewhere other than Earth. He had therefore spent most of his 15 odd years there picking up static. Most of it was unexplained, but nothing remotely intelligible. But the work was simple and straightforward. For the competent and indolent mind of Dr. Phil Waters, it was an easy way to earn a low six-figure salary and a very comfortable pension. Except on nights like these. He had got into his car 20 minutes ago, still with his slippers on, cursing Adam Daystead. Daystead was a junior researcher at the ETRU. Like most, he was supposed to coast along in the department for a few years, show the powers that be that he was vaguely competent, and then get promoted and move on to another federal research department where he could do something more interesting. But sadly for Dr. Waters, Adam Daystead had other plans. Daystead loved what they did at the ETRU, and he practically worshipped Waters. Waters couldn't stand a kiss ass, so put Daystead on the overnight shifts wherever possible. All the junior researchers had to do overnight shifts at least four a month in rotation. Waters increased the number that Daystead had to do, but the young man didn't seem to mind one bit. Over the past two years, Daystead had called Waters up in the wee small hours on three separate occasions, all excited about some signal that he had received and was analysing, convinced that it was some sort of extraterrestrial message. In all three occasions, it turned out to be nothing. Every signal they found at ETRU always turned out to be insignificant. Tonight was the fourth call. Dr. Waters pulled up, quickly showed the half-asleep guard on the gate his ID and parked his car as close to the main entrance of the ETRU building as possible. If Daystead calls me a fifth, no, a sixth time, he decided he's fired. Dr. Waters walked into the signal processing room to find Daystead, immaculately dressed as usual, pacing up and down waiting for him to enter. His eyes lit up as soon as Waters opened the door. Waters failed to suppress a groan. Dr. Walters, thank God you're here, Daystead gasped. What is it this time? Walters did nothing to repress his lack of enthusiasm. He knew the kid was just trying to impress him. That's what all this was about. But getting him to work five hours earlier than he's supposed to was not the way to go about it. This came through on Channel 65, said Daystead, adjusting his glasses, then hurrying over to a computer with a huge pair of speakers plugged in. Probably static, sighed Walters. It can't be, sir. This channel is pointed at Quadrant Alpha 34. It's the only feed on our whole grid right now that should be a total silence, unless something is trying to communicate with us. But, but listen. Daystead flipped a switch. 
Dr. Walters reflectively called out, Jesus Christ, as his ears were deafened by the loud blast of static noise from the large black speakers. They said immediately turn the volume down to a more manageable level for four in the morning. Ah, oh, sorry, Dr. Waters. A sheepish look on his face. Waters paused for a second to listen. Just static. Yeah, he began dispassionately. That feed is supposed to be clean, but maybe it's interference. Problem with the dish, anything. I told you before, there's lots of noise out there and we can't just explain all of it. And just because we can't explain it doesn't mean we're getting messages from little green men. Waters was surprised to see Daystead suddenly stand tall with a confidence that wasn't usually becoming of him. The kid removed his glasses and looked Waters right in the eye. I've already done all the main checks. Believe me, I wouldn't call you at this time in the morning unless I was positive. Not like last time. Dr. Waters couldn't help grimace slightly. Last time, he was called up at two in the morning. So this was something of an improvement. While Waters grabbed some coffee from the office machine, Daystead handed him a series of data sheets with verified information about the satellite that was picking up the static. Daystead was right. Everything seemed to be in order. Well, said Waters, hazarding a final guess before he went to doze off in his office for an hour. Maybe it's noise from radiation. That dish goes out pretty far. Maybe it's caught the radiation trail of a distant planet. Sun from a solar system, you know, something like that. Daystead smiled, his confidence not wavering. He clearly still held the killer info that Waters had yet to debunk. If it were just random radiation interference from another part of the galaxy, I wouldn't have called you, Dr. Waters. But I ran the static through our filtration software. It sounds to you and me like a load of static, but when you slow it down... It's a uniform series of beats and pauses. Raw, binary data. What? It's running in a loop, sending the same signal every five seconds. I got the machine coder to lay out the ones and zeros and compile it. The binary data was actually a blueprint for some slightly more advanced hexadecimal data. Once I'd found out what that is, I had our system compile it too. Turns out, it's just a single file. Dr. Waters had gotten a little lost in the jargon. He took a swig from his coffee cup. What are you telling me, Adam? Adam Daystead smiled. A computer is decoding the file now. But I've already assembled the table of contents header in the file. It's an MP3 file. It's 12 seconds long. I did a full system-wide check about an hour ago to make sure no one was playing a prank... The signal came from deep space deliberately and purposefully. Someone or something from another planet has intentionally sent us an audio file in a human-created computer format, a format that we can understand. The only thing Dr. Waters heard after that was the sound of his coffee mug hitting the tiled floor. Part 2. The morning meetings with his chief of staff, Laura Palmer, had gotten easier over the last two years. President Joe Fisher was, though he'd never tell her, actually beginning to enjoy them a little. Two years into his administration, and things were going much better than he ever could have guessed. Laura had been with him from the beginning. Joe had hired her as his personal assistant when he started his first cleaning products business. She was smart and knew the endless bureaucratic rules that one had to comply with when making and selling carpet cleaner. Joe spent nearly three years selling his wares from door to door. He had the personal touch. Eight years later, he was the CEO of a $2 billion business and Laura was with him all the way. Many of his friends had persuaded him to run for office as a state senator or maybe even for governor of his home state of Nevada. He was always politically minded and inspirationally articulate. But it wasn't for him, or so he thought. In order to fob off their ideas, 
he used to say, what would the point be? All the power in this country has been concentrated to the head of the executive branch of the federal government. If you really want to dismantle that power and free us all again, you have to run for president. And I don't think I have that kind of power. But after a while, and with Laura pushing all the way, of course, Joe started to strongly consider it. What if he were president? He knew how to lead, but he also knew how to liberate. His business only became the multi-billion dollar success it had because he stood back and let his managers and staff be creative and come up with new ways of innovating. Why couldn't he implement that way of thinking in the White House too? It was his wife Paula who finally gave him the push he needed. She had made him a lovely dinner, highly unusual as he was usually the one who cooks. And as they sat on the floor by the open fire in the front room, she poured him a glass of red wine and looked him in the eye. I want you to run, she said, but on one proviso. He looked at her and smiled. She was really serious. Okay, name it. Always tell the truth, Joe. Don't let pollsters convince you to downplay your feelings. Don't shy away from the controversial things you think will make this country better. I want you to tell the truth. And then if you lose, and <laughs> I think you will, you can do so with no compromises and with a full heart. It wasn't the most conventional motivation he'd had in his life, but it worked. So, Joe Fisher from Nevada ran for office. He was considered by most to be the lunatic on the fringes. Many said his non-interventionism and soft position on immigration made it impossible for him to be a serious contender for the Republican nomination. He openly agreed with everyone who said it. The Democrats said that his stance against government-enforced welfare was not what most people wanted, and they preferred to have wise men in Washington redistributing the wealth because those people knew what was best. Joe agreed, yes, this is what most people think. But he just kept telling the truth as he saw it. He would pay for TV spots where he'd explain the economics of Hayek, why the world was in the financial trouble that it was, why policing the world had made us all less safe, not more so, why freedom of the body and mind was not only the right thing to do from a pragmatic standpoint, but also from a moral one. At first, the major networks didn't include him in the debates, but before long, an internet grassroots campaign pushed him to the forefront. NBC didn't include him in their primary debate, and of the people polled after the show, 56% said they'd vote for other out of the candidates on offer. It was clear that that other was Joe Fisher. Despite the establishment's best efforts, he won the Republican primaries. The others didn't even come close. It was a new dawn. Freedom was the only thing people seemed to care about. Joe had changed the agenda and his landslide victory against the Democratic incumbent was already the stuff of legend. Big business, big oil, big pharma, big unions, and all the vested interests backed the incumbent. But Joe outdid him in campaign contributions at a ratio of 3 to 1. His average campaign donation was $45. Ordinary Americans had decided that enough was enough. They needed change, and it had to be radical. Other countries and supranational organisations warned by letting an extremist like Joe Fisher be president. It meant that America would be isolated from the world. But again, Fisher explained calmly and rationally in his telebroadcasts and online why this would not be the case. It just galvanised the people to him even more. He made Laura Palmer his chief of staff. Another controversial decision. The chattering classes in Washington felt it would be better for him to employ someone from within the D.C. machine who knew the rules of the game. But, President Fisher always said, we're changing the rules, right? Why would I want to start with a badly dealt hand right from the get-go? Palmer resisted the idea at first. She thought it would be bad for Fisher politically. He only had to make it clear to her once that he didn't care about politics at all. He got to the top job by telling the truth and doing the right thing no matter how difficult. And it was difficult to start. He started to roll back the frontiers of the state, his 
Poll rating shattered. The first year was a nightmare. He had run on the promise of being a one-term president because no one should hold this position of power for too long, or so he said. But it seemed there was no chance of him doing more than one term, even if he wanted to. The morning meetings with Laura were pretty bad. They had inherited a social, economic and, frankly, moral mess. But over the months, President Fisher's policies started to bear fruit. He was coming to the middle of his first term in office and things were finally fitting into place. His influence was touching every corner of the globe by preaching a decentralised, global, free practice. Trade was skyrocketing, global poverty was plummeting and his non-interventionist policies were both bringing people together and setting a long-term agenda for world peace. Every nation that the US had trade sanctions with had gotten better. He lifted the sanctions and allowed free trade to flourish. Half of the world's worst regimes had collapsed under the frenetic pace of a free market. It got to the point that he was right back up in the polls. Things were really getting better, just as he'd promised. On the agenda that day, Laura was running through the issues of the world. We're still looking good out there, Mr. President, she said, and it's getting better every day. You know... They still want you to accept the Nobel Peace Prize. The president smiled. Right. If they actually offer it, I think there's more actual peace that needs to be, you know, achieved first. Well, you're doing pretty well there too. This stupid war between Britain and Brazil is finally falling apart. The British government, they they can't afford it anymore. And the people in the UK are fed up. All the scandal involving those British soldiers getting killed for uncovering the gold theft is playing very badly over there. They want to be free again. They see what's going on over here, and that's what they want too. They're taking to the streets, demanding. They've already seen the beginning of the dismantling of the European Union, and we know that the UN isn't far behind. The UK general election's like, what, nine months away? I think we'll see a change of policy then, if not before. Good. He said the word, but President Fisher's face did not seem to realize it. Laura put her file on the floor and leaned over to him. What's wrong, Joe? Oh, nothing, nothing. It's just... There's so much more to do. Well, you could always run for a second term and, you know, finish what you started? No, I have to finish it in one term. I said that no one should have this power for too long, and I meant it. I just wish I could make things better faster. Remember what you always told me? When things go wrong and the government is wise enough not to step in, the people find a way. A spontaneous order. Do you remember that? Fisher nodded. How could he forget? It helped him win the debate in Iowa. I know there's lots to do. But the times are changing. Even when you're not in the White House any longer, the momentum you've created won't stop. Everything is getting better all the time. Sure, you've got more enemies now, on the left and on the right. But the people will support you and stand up against these authoritarians. For now, he said. Yes, for now. But that can't just suddenly change. I think it can, Laura, and it has. History proves it. And all it would take is a big incident before the people would... Instantly brush aside their freedoms for more security. Fear is the most powerful of all the mystical forces against the reality of freedom. She looked down. She wanted to respond, to tell him that this was not true, but she knew he was right. Well then, Mr. President, she finally said, we'll just have to hope that doesn't happen. Fisher smiled and stood up gently tapping her shoulder. Yes, we will, Miss Palmer. He crossed the Oval Office and walked over to the window behind his desk, looking out onto the Rose Garden. What's on the agenda today, then? She didn't have time to pick up her file before one of the doors burst open. It was Greg Kilman, Secretary of Defence. He was one of the youngest people to hold that post in recent memory, being only 42, but the grey of his temples and worry lines on his face made him look much older. And he looked even worse today. 
The president turned to face him. What's the matter, Greg? I'm so sorry to burst in like this, Mr. President, but there's something deeply important that requires your attention right now. Part 3. When his team had to move, boy, did they move. President Fisher's head was still whirling. He barely had any time to let the news sink in himself before a teleconference was set up. It was like something out of a movie. Greg Kilman, his Secretary of Defence, had been the first one to tell him. Less than 15 minutes later, Fisher was sitting in front of a bank of nine monitors, all of them relaying the images of the most important world leaders. Then, as best as he could... He described to them what the situation was. Sol Korosawi, the head of the United Nations, was the last one he could get in contact with. The other leaders, including the Prime Minister of Great Britain, the President of France and the Chancellor of Germany, all waited patiently, staring at Fischer from each video screen. They knew by the look on his face that this wasn't just a shoot-the-breeze call. And they were right. I wanted to tell you this right away. President Fisher began, before you hear it from a leaked source or something. My people are sending you all the technical details you need on this. It's an American discovery, but I strongly believe it's a global situation, and the whole world needs to know about it. Corisauri, the UN logo behind him, looked impatient. What is it you wish to tell us, Mr. President? Fisher took a deep breath. A division of NASA has intercepted an audio signal that was deliberately targeted at one of our satellites. The full nature of the signal is as yet uncertain, but there is one thing our scientists discovered about an hour ago. The signal came from deep space. I mean, like a long way from our solar system. By the time the signal bounced onto our satellite, it had somehow converted itself into an audio frequency that our computers could easily understand. The Prime Minister of Britain frowned. On the three occasions they met, he made it perfectly clear in his attitude that he had no time for the new American president, and Fisher felt likewise about him. What do you mean, it somehow converted itself? Converted from what? Like I said, the details are sketchy, but it appears this transmission was, for want of a better word, beamed to our satellite at a speed far beyond the speed of light and then unfolded as a regular audio transmission once it arrived. If it was just an audio signal, it would have taken thousands, maybe millions of years to get here, but the way it was sent using technology we don't know about means they could have sent it in just a few seconds. The Prime Minister's frown didn't waver. Anyway, Fisher continued, the signal sounded like raw static at first, but it took just a few minutes for our team to unravel it as a binary signal. Once they unraveled it, they found the signal was an audio file in MP3 form. MP3? asked Corisari. Yes, you know, the audio format most of us convert our music to. Download music, listen to our iPods, that sort of thing. Corisari still didn't seem to understand what it meant, but Fisher carried on. This MP3 was compiled by our team. Let me play it to you now. Fisher nodded to one of his aides. They switched on the playback device. Once the audio file played, Fisher saw all nine faces staring at him, open-mouthed. The audio was in English. Fisher couldn't help think that the language was somewhat mechanical as well, but it had a slight American twang. President Fisher was taken aback too. It was only the second time he had heard the recording. Kind greetings to the people of Earth. Please do not be alarmed. We mean you no harm. We come in peace for the benefit of ourselves and of mankind. Please prepare for us August the 9th in Washington, D.C. There is nothing to fear. We only wish to bring peace, reason and love. Part 4. Peace, Reason and Love 
Those words were on billboards and advertising stands all over the world. Millions of people were out on the streets. Others were huddled in churches. In the US, sales of bunkers, guns and back garden shelters had gone through the roof. Many cried Armageddon. Others said it was all a hoax. But that morning, the world awoke earlier than usual and turned on their television sets and waited. It was August 9th. President Fisher was alone in the Oval Office. The past few weeks had been a blur. Though he didn't dare admit it to anyone other than his wife, he felt like he was losing control. But he had won on a platform that renounced control. He remembered his last presidential debate against his Democratic opponent. I guess that's the difference between us, sir, he said. You want control. You want to run our lives. You say you know what's best for us. I don't know what's best for anyone. I have a hard time thinking what's best for me. I don't want to run anyone's life. I want to ensure Americans stay free. The Constitution doesn't give me the authority to do anything else. When I become the next president of these United States, I shall be the first in nearly a century who, when taking the oath and saying I swear to protect and defend the Constitution really means it. The audience had gone wild. Fisher's poll numbers went through the roof. That was the night he won, and the night he had started to change the world for the better. But now, things felt darker than they had been since he took office. Religious hysteria was rife. It had taken on a new, more vivid form. Politicians, both Republican and Democrat, were suddenly posturing against the president. They demanded that he show more authority during this crisis. But what was the crisis? There was still every chance that the recorded message was faked in some elaborate way the government's best minds couldn't see. And if it wasn't faked, then surely the rational thing to do was to cautiously welcome whoever or whatever was out there. But that message just wasn't getting through. The opinion poll showed that people were once again favouring politicians who use words like security and support over those like Fisher who used words like love and freedom. There had been an emergency reconvening of the European Union even though it had been officially decoupled. The talk of disbanding the corrupt United Nations was suddenly dismissed as a deeply foolish thing to do in these times of emergency. The general feeling amongst the people was that either President Fisher was the victim of a hoax, in which case he's an idiot, or he's being selfish by agreeing to the terms the aliens had set. They had stated clearly that they would arrive in Washington, D.C. Fisher publicly stated that he agreed with this request. What else could he do? What else did they expect of him? It's not like he could communicate back. The killer blow came when, during an interview on CNN that was played out all over the world, Fisher simply stated, If they, whoever they are, wish to deal with the United States first, well, I believe that is their right. You know, they're welcome to change their minds and talk to Britain or Russia or Mongolia first if they wish, but they have stated their intentions. And they will not receive any hostility from me for that. Americans thought his response was weak and didn't affirm America's national greatness. Other nations thought the president was being arrogant and was just another dumb yank who didn't understand the importance of the rest of the world. President Fisher just couldn't win. Of those who said it must be a hoax, they asked, as the president first did, how could an alien race even know of such a thing as August the 9th? The date is, after all, a human concept and a relatively recent one at that. But the scientists at the ETIU said that the aliens could have been monitoring our media and communications for many decades without us knowing. That is how they knew the details of our customs and language. They probably knew full well that Washington, D.C. was the capital of the most powerful nation on Earth. The research they had done into the transmission that was sent was showing signs of proving just that. However, they were still none the wiser as to how that transmission could have been sent so quickly from the far reaches of space. But here it was clearly displayed on the clock on his desk in the Oval Office. August 9th. It was 8.55 in the morning. President Fisher had been up since midnight. As soon as it became August 9th, he shunned the pretense of sleeping. He left his wife in bed 
but she joined him downstairs in the Oval Office only an hour later. But he had ordered her, in a friendly way, back to bed after she yawned for the 100th time at 6am. But he didn't feel tired, not one bit. He had been getting reports every hour, and each time they were still the same. Still no sign of anything within tens of thousands of miles of Earth. It had been nearly an hour since the last report. Then the sleep suddenly washed over him. Of course this was a hoax. How could it be anything else? He suddenly felt an extreme desire to close his eyes. Rest his head on the desk for a few minutes. He longed for it to be August the 10th. Just as he let his eyelids drop, one of the doors to his office burst open. President Fisher jerked upright. It was one of his secret service agents. The agent didn't seem phased by the sight of his boss nodding off. Before Fisher could ask anything, the young man in the black suit simply spoke with polite authority. Mr. President, we need to take you to the underground bunker right away. Part 5 The only light in the room seemed to be the harsh glare of the communication screens. The President stood looking at all of them at once, trying to concentrate on each, but like a magnet he couldn't keep his eyes off the large one in the centre for too long. He was deep within the White House bunker. He could operate everything he needed from here. He had insisted they take his wife there before he came down, and she was down with him now, sitting anxiously in the family suite of the bunker. His generals were gathered around. They too could not keep their eyes off the main screen. The screen showed a giant vessel. It looked like a bowling pin that had been knocked down, laying on its side. It's about the size of Manhattan, said a young man with thick lens glasses and a scientist pass on his jacket the president hadn't met before. The young man did not introduce himself and the president did not bother to ask. Civility seemed trivial now. I thought we were tracking Earth's airspace for thousands of miles out, said Fisher. How do we miss this? It just seemed to appear, Mr. President, the young scientist said. We're gathering data from our satellites now, but the best we can guess is that it somehow propelled itself here out of some sort of self-created black hole. How long has it been here? About 15 minutes. What is it doing? It's aligned itself with our orbit and it's deliberately positioned itself not to damage any of our orbiting satellites or have any major gravitational issues. It's like it's deliberately waiting, giving us the time to gather together all the data we needed. Needed for what? The young scientist shrugged. I don't know. So we can analyze it? Make sure it's not going to explode and take the northern hemisphere with it? A couple of generals stared at the young man with contempt. He bowed his head slightly in recognition of his insensitive faux power and stepped back. The president felt a hand on his shoulder. It was Laura Palmer. He let himself breathe for a second. It was just better knowing his chief of staff was there, but the breath was cut short. It was clear Laura knew something he didn't. What is it? He instinctively asked. I'm not sure how to even... What is it, Laura? She took a second to compose herself. We just got word from NORAD. Somehow, someone on that ship has gotten in touch. They've used our official protocols to request permission to enter a small craft into U.S. airspace and land at a precise location. What location? They've sent us the GPS coordinates. She took another breath. They wish to land on the White House lawn. Fisher nearly did a double take. That was not what he was expecting. Can we talk to them? Yes. They've given us a frequency on an open channel. It's one that we're not using, but one we can easily use if we want to. It's like they're making it as easy as possible to accommodate our technology and initiate communication. The president looked at the young man who was talking to him before. Can we pick up this frequency in this room? Oh, well, yes, Mr. President, that should be pretty easy. He scurried over to a console and, after talking to another technician, turned back and said, We're listening in now, sir. Right. This is it. Fisher turned back to Laura. 
Tell Nora to give them the okay to land on the White House lawn. Immediately behind Laura, one of her assistants was already talking to Norad on a walkie-talkie. The eagle has given the green light. I repeat, the eagle has given the green light. One of his generals leant over to Fisher. Mr. President, I must protest. This is not wise. Can we have them land elsewhere? From the walkie-talkie, a static-filled response. Roger, stand by. Fisher placed his hand on the general's shoulder and tried his best to smile reassuringly. Too late now, my friend. They all turned to face the big screen. Over the speaker, they heard a communications officer with a strong South Carolina accent say, This is the United States Air Defense speaking to the alien craft. You have permission to land a small craft at the coordinates you requested. Over. There was a second silence. It seemed like an hour. Then they heard a distinct, articulate, upper-class British accent saying, Thank you, United States Air Defense for granting us permission. We shall be entering your airspace and landing in a few minutes. Please stand by. And once again, there is nothing to be afraid of, I assure you. Over and out. Secretary of Defense Greg Kilman whispered in Fisher's ear, Mr. President, shall I take us to DEFCON 4? Fisher turned to face him. No. Stay at 3 for now. Everyone's eyes were glued to the screen. Presumably, from somewhere on that immense vessel in the sky, a tiny craft, in the shape of a half-disc, flew away and into our atmosphere. The main screen switched to another camera, showing the craft burning red as it entered Earth's atmosphere. Jesus, the young scientist said breathlessly. That thing's travelling faster than any ship that's ever... He didn't need to finish the sentence. Everyone in the room could see what he meant. They lost sight of it on screen. Where is it now? Fisher demanded. Wait, wait, a technician responded. Wait, it's it's already slowly descending onto the White House lawn. A few other technicians pressed some buttons, and the CCTV shots of the White House lawn came into view. The craft, now clearly the size of a small truck, slowly landed on the grass. All around, men in military uniforms surrounded it. M16s at the ready. Fisher noticed at least one tank and several other military vehicles too. Then Fisher noticed it. The ship hadn't actually landed at all. It was hovering about two feet from the ground. Now what? Fisher hadn't even realised he said it. No one replied. They suddenly saw a hatch open and a few stairs elegantly glided out onto the ground. All they could see was white light emanating from the ship. Then, stepping from the light, emerged some sort of figure, almost out of focus at first, but it looked human. It was a slim, white male. Looked about 30. It had brown hair, blue eyes. It wore a regular-looking grey suit, the sort of thing you buy off the rack in any department store. It, or he, stepped out of the vessel and onto the lawn with a confident and friendly smile. As soon as his foot left the last step, the stairs glided back up into the ship and the hatch closed. Totally assured of himself, he held up his hand in what almost looked like a friendly wave. With the friendliest of smiles, He simply said, Hi. Fisher could see the officers around him didn't know what to do. They kept their guns on him, but no one knew what to say next. Fisher's greatest fear was that in five seconds he was going to be asked, and even he didn't know what to do. After five seconds, the alien, or whatever he was, said, with the same polite, upper-class British accent they had heard before, and while still smiling that confident and relaxed smile... Let me help. I mean you no harm at all. I wish to speak to Joe Fisher, your president. I understand that you may wish to quarantine me. That is totally fine and perfectly understandable. Whatever you need to do, please do. My ship will stay here, but by all means, lead on. Fisher couldn't take his eyes off the screen, but finally managed to do so to see that everyone in the room was staring at him. It was time to make a decision. 
Right. Uh, bring him to the other bunker. Once they've assessed the safety of the situation further, I will see him there. Everyone seemed more relaxed that someone had made a decision. The presidential order was conveyed to the soldiers on the ground. One of them finally lowered his weapon and, with a bravery he never knew he had, walked cautiously over to the alien and asked, President Fisher wishes to speak with you. Once we have assessed the situation to be safe, can you come with me? The alien, this young man in a grey suit, still smiling, nodded and said, But of course, please lead the way. Part 6 Four hours of nervousness and vacillation had passed. President Fisher was walking down the long hallway in Bunker 2, where this person, whatever it was, had been kept. Laura Palmer was walking right beside him. It felt good knowing she was there. One level head that saw things with clarity and filtered out all the crap so Joe could make whatever decision he needed to. Before he decided it was finally right to go to this being, he went into the family room to see his wife. They didn't say anything to each other. They didn't need to. She just held him and looked him in the eye and nodded. It was all he needed to continue. A middle-aged military man with greying temples and horn-rimmed glasses was escorting Laura and the president. He didn't look like he'd ever seen any action in the field, but was making up for it now with an assertive confidence of knowledge. Fisher hadn't caught the guy's name, like so many others today, but could tell that whoever he was, he had been preparing for a day like this all his life. So far, the subject has been 100% compliant with our request, Mr. President, the officer was continuing. He has happily answered all our questions, though we've mostly just asked if he poses a risk or a threat of contamination. And what did he say to that? asked Laura. He said that he posed no risk to us, chemical or otherwise. Our tests for radiation and other chemicals confirm this. He told us that the ship he landed in is only emitting a trace of water vapor. And you've checked this for yourselves? asked Fisher. Yes, sir. We don't know the exact makeup of the craft he landed in, but it's clear that it's a very advanced compound. Considering it only landed on Earth and entered our atmosphere four hours ago, the temperature is an even 72 degrees, the same as the outdoor temperature of the city today. It's as if it's always been here. We're conducting spectrum scans, like I said, in its advanced compound, but outside of that, I can't tell you much more. What do you know about the... alien itself? I mean, he looks human. And that's the way he looks from the inside too, Mr. President. He allowed us to conduct a full body scan, x-rays, blood tests, the works. He's perfectly human in every way. The only major difference is the brain scan. His cerebral activity is off the charts. There's a lot going on in that brain. Outside of that, he's just the picture of health. O2 negative blood type, not a scratch on him. He's almost like... The officer slowed down as he tried to search for the words. Almost like what? asked Fisher. Almost like a newborn baby, but fully formed. They continued walking. We're nearly there, said Laura. So, one last time. Is there anything about this man, or whatever it is, that can harm the commander-in-chief? No, Miss Palmer, said the officer. We've done every type of scan and search we can, barring a high-end medical procedure. He's clean, from what I can see. He's put his suit back on, but was happy to undress for us and conduct the scans. The suit has no brand labels or anything like that, and is cut with a fine yet conventional material. It's like he bought it off the rack at J.C. Penney. He's carrying no weapons and has, as of yet, given us no reason to suspect that he's a threat. And with that, they made it to the door. It was being guarded by two special ops troops. The door opened. Fisher took a breath, then crossed the threshold with Laura still by his side. Inside were almost 30 scientists and special ops guys, lots of weapons and scientific monitoring equipment. On the other side of the six-inch thick protective glass sat a man who had gotten out of the spacecraft just four hours ago. He still had a slight smile on his face and sat on the chair, legs crossed, facing the glass, like he hadn't a care in the world. The room Fisher had stepped into was dark, but on the other side of the glass where the alien was sitting, it was padded and engulfed in a bright white light. The room was spotless. The other world leaders had protested a great deal, as did the president's security team, that Fisher should be the first one to make official contact, 
But after a few hours of wrangling, mostly by Laura, the president got his wish. And here he was. As soon as the man in the bright lights behind the protective glass saw him, he stood up and smiled even more. Mr. President, it is an honour to meet you, he said, standing up with his voice coming through the speakers that were in the room. Please remain seated, said one of the scientists. Oh, yes, of course, said the alien, almost apologetically. He sat immediately down and crossed his legs again, leaning back with a relaxed confidence. It is a pleasure to meet you on behalf of all mankind, said Fisher. He hadn't thought about what he was going to say first and almost berated himself for such a cheesy start. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, please, call me Joe. All my friends do. The alien smiled. <laughs> All right, Joe. Please call me Adam. Adam? Is that your real name? Oh, well, where I'm from, we don't deal with names, per se. We have other ways of identifying and communicating, but for your conventions on this planet, and considering your more recent mythologies, traditions, I thought the name Adam would be appropriate. Fisher couldn't help note the biblical reference. Adam, the first man. OK, Adam, and where is it that you are from? I am from a planet whose physiological matter is very different to yours. I have arrived in this form so that I can communicate more effectively to you without any significant barriers. And so what do you look like normally? Fisher asked. He could tell by the murmuring around him that this was the question the scientists were most eager to ask themselves. Adam smiled, then put his hand to his lips, rubbing them like he was trying to solve a difficult equation in his head, rubbing his chin like he'd been doing it all his life. Hmm, I'm sorry. There is, I think, no words in any of your languages that really do justice. I suppose you could say that I look like light. It's just the evolutionary direction that my species had taken. And what are your species? What do you call yourselves? Hmm. Until you have a label that you'd care to come up with to describe us, uh, I would suggest that you merely call us the aliens. <laughs> we don't mind. He smiled again. Very well, said Fisher. And are you alone? Oh, no, no, no. The large spaceship that I came in has over 10,000 of my fellow beings. And you're peaceful. Adam smiled reassuringly. Absolutely. We couldn't have made the technology we had, achieved all that we have achieved, without learning some key values of objective freedom and reason. Fisher looked into Adam's eyes and believed him. But now what? <laughs> there are so many questions, Adam. I... I don't know where to begin, and I will happily answer them all in time. Why not start of the ones you think of first? They may be the most pertinent. Right. OK, so why are you here? Why come to Earth? We monitor many worlds throughout the universe. We have been secretly monitoring Earth for many hundreds of millennia. And why haven't you made contact before? Uh, well, we have come close at certain periods of human history. There was never a need before then, because for most of this planet's four and a half billion year existence, no intelligent beings had evolved here. Over the last couple million years, we've seen the apes gain more and more, uh, what do you call it, sentient knowledge. And now this is where you are. And you will continue to grow too. You're doing it every day. You've been monitoring our progress for a long time, then. <laughs> we certainly have, Mr. President. And you say you've nearly come close to making contact before? Mm, maybe I shouldn't say close, but it's certainly been on the cards, as you could say. When some of your species started to develop language and write, when some of them in England signed the Magna Carta or the Great Charter of Freedom, we certainly, to use one of your colourful phrases, pricked our ears up. 
The era of enlightenment was a cause of great hope for your species too. And when the founders of America declared that all men are created equal and had certain inalienable rights by virtue of their birth, we knew it was only a matter of time. So you're saying that whenever we've made some social progress, you've been drawing closer towards meeting us. That's a little simplistic, but you're getting the gist. A few things have happened in the last couple of years, your election being one of them, Mr. President, that finally made some of my species feel that the human race is ready. Ready for what? Adam smiled again and leant just a little closer to the glass. No one stopped him this time. They all wanted to hear what he was going to say. For reason, Mr. President. For truth. For the assistance and continuation of the enlightenment that your species has embarked upon. We believe that with your voluntary cooperation and friendship, your remarkable species is now ready for the next stage. Part 7 Nearly four weeks had passed, and the hysteria amongst the people had seemed to calm down a bit. Since Adam arrived for the first time, other aliens, all dressed in similar suits and in human form, had arrived all over the world. Each of them would ask permission, using the correct protocols of the country they were landing in, and they would ask permission to leave as well. So far, permission was always granted. The world leaders had thus far followed President Fisher's example. However, things weren't so rosy for the President. Despite the overwhelming success of the first contact humans had with extraterrestrial intelligent life, Fisher's poll ratings were still flat. Most of the aliens had landed in the US, and apart from Fisher and the president of Brazil, the aliens didn't seem that interested in talking to any other world leaders. They did what was required of them, of course, photo ops with the French president, brief introductory meetings with the German chancellor and so on, but on the whole, most of the aliens wanted to talk to our scientists, thinkers, artists and great minds. The world's newspapers started condemning the inappropriate attitude of the newcomers as highly elitist. The British government had been especially hostile. It was touch and go whether or not some of the aliens would even be allowed into the UK. So far, they'd only had two aliens land there, and since then the aliens used public communication channels to politely request that they meet with British artists and scholars in other countries to avoid the bureaucratic trouble caused by the government in Westminster. What made things worse, in the British Prime Minister's eyes at least, was that the aliens had spent a great deal of time talking with the government of Brazil. Britain still had a ceasefire with Brazil, but there was a talk of it not lasting. The re-emergence of war was looming closer every day. Fisher adjusted his tie in the lobby of the main chamber of the United Nations building in New York. Adam was standing beside him. <laughs> you look fine, Mr. President. I'd feel a whole lot better if you were coming in with me to make your case. Adam smiled. Sadly, the United Nations overwhelmingly voted not to allow aliens into the chamber. Fisher nodded and smiled back. Adam was right. In a funny way, the two had become friends, and they had started to pick up on each other's signals. Adam had a fairly dry wit, it seemed, and could detect the same strain of humour in the American president. But there was a nervousness in Fisher today. The meeting he was about to attend was very important, and he knew it. So far, the aliens had been given free reign over whom they could see and speak to, but the British government, with the backing of the other permanent members of the Security Council excluding America, had insisted on a series of hearings. The issue of who gets to speak with the aliens was now going to be voted for democratically rather than the current anarchic situation that threatened to destabilise the order of intergovernmental functions. Fisher always wondered why these guys use such complicated doublespeak. Adam and the other aliens were a delight in contrast. Adam had often stayed up very late with President Fisher and answered all of the questions as best he could. The aliens were striving to be honest, and that honesty was often mistaken by other world leaders as aggressive bluntness. But Fisher knew that it was the contrast between the leaders and these aliens that bothered them so much. The aliens just said what they meant and meant what they said. It was a very, for want of a better word, alien experience for the men and women used to the grind of global politics. 
The main door of the UN chamber finally opened. Fisher could hear the sound of the chairman saying, And also, to answer questions and shed more light on what the aliens want, I call upon President Joseph Fisher of the United States of America. Joe swallowed and hesitated for a moment. Adam, noticing his apprehension, put his hand lightly on the president's shoulder. It'll be fine, Mr. President. Just tell them what you think and feel. They can't ask for more than that. Fisher smiled at his new friend. Thanks, Adam. For everything. He was nearly two hours into the talk and Fisher felt he needed a break. They kept saying that they were nearly done, but this was beginning to feel like a hostile interrogation, a test of how long they could keep the American president on his feet, defending what shouldn't need defending. Defending what should be self-evident to humanity. This question of the first visitor that came to see you, Mr. President, said the UN chairman. Adam, I believe he calls himself. Why was he the first? Has he explained that to you? Has he explained anything to you? Of course, said Fisher, trying to hide the fatigue in his voice. Adam, like all the aliens, has been nothing but forthcoming to me and everyone else that they have come in contact with. He was the first to make contact because he is the nearest thing to one of the heads of executive government they have. So they do have a government. Is it a democratic one? Yes, they are elected. And for Adam, like all elected officials in this world, his powers are severely limited. Even making his first contact with us was not his choice. Their legislative branch made that decision. And the greatest amount of power lies with their people. A great many aliens volunteered to come and see us in that huge spaceship that's currently orbiting Earth. With our permission, they come and go in those smaller craft as they please, but they do not need permission from Adam. The aliens are free to make their own decisions, and that level of freedom has been true for them for hundreds of millions, possibly billions of years. Are you seriously suggesting that these aliens are arriving on Earth without receiving specific instructions from their leaders? The way they see it, Mr. Chairman... They don't have leaders. Just a government. Yes, they come here of their own free will. And to what purpose? This seems like near anarchy to me. I can assure the council that there's nothing dangerous or underhanded in their motives, said Fisher. They just want to talk to us and learn from us as individuals. And in time, they have many things they wish to teach us. The planet is many light years away, but selected humans, if they are willing, may soon be allowed to visit it pending the decisions made in this council. Does that mean the United Nations will get to decide which humans can visit this alien planet? No, they just don't think like that, said Fisher, getting exhausted covering this ground all over again. Decisions like that don't get made by governments, only individuals. If an individual alien wishes to take an individual human to see the other planet, a scientist, or a poet, or a philosopher, maybe, someone who they feel can communicate back to us the amazing things they see, then they may. It's a contract of individuals made by mutual consent, not by government, not by force. On the flight back to Washington, D.C., President Fisher could barely look up to Adam. He felt ashamed. But Adam was very kind and understanding, reassuring him that it was not his fault and the Fisher did everything he could and said all the right things. What had happened was sadly inevitable. By the time Fisher's questioning was over, the British representative at the UN relayed word from the UK government. They had decreed that no aliens will be allowed to land on United Kingdom soil until they agreed to do so by new proper channels. It was not enough that the aliens had happily availed themselves to the UK immigration and quarantine, or that they had asked permission before coming in. They had to now provide a week in advance, a good reason for coming to the UK. It's not enough, the British representative said, for them to turn up and show us that they mean us no harm. They must only arrive for government-approved purposes. A cheer went up through the UN Council chamber. It was the galvanising force they had collectively been waiting for. President Fisher tried through his exhaustion to plead with the Council, but the UN had already made up their minds. This was to be the way forward. This was progress. And upon democratic agreement of every supranational entity around the world, from the newly reformed European Union to the United Nations, even the World Bank, a new centralised system was to be adopted to vet every application of every alien wishing to come and walk on Earth. 
If an alien wanted to come to Earth, it was up to the world leaders from now on. Part 8 President Fisher had been staring at the portrait of Thomas Jefferson that hung up in the Oval Office. He was alone and often spent minutes sitting at this desk looking up at the 18th century statesman. Today, he was wondering what he'd make of everything that had happened. The president had cut down his public engagements as best he could. It was the most important and exciting time in the history of humanity, and yet he couldn't help feel this dark cloud hanging over everything. A dread of inevitability. But what was it that was inevitable? It was just two weeks ago that he was excused from the UN chamber. Two days later, the UN unanimously voted to create an international contact committee to be the sole human contact point for each alien that wished to come to Earth. Fisher used his influence to make sure America vetoed the bill, but the veto was considered null and void due to the extraordinary circumstances involving global security. Fisher was blasted by the American press and the press of the rest of the world as being a naive isolationist. Fisher didn't know how someone who wanted as much freedom for the people and aliens as possible could be considered isolationist, but didn't spend much time arguing his point. He knew it was useless anyway. People didn't want to hear reason. They wanted to see action. The newly created ICC declared to Adam and the rest of the aliens that they all had 72 hours from a set time to leave Earth in their crafts. And then, from then on, the aliens could talk only to the ICC if they wished to return to Earth, and only for set periods of time. The aliens all fully complied. Every one of them, including Adam, left within 72 hours. Since then, the huge ship stayed above Earth's atmosphere, in silence. That all happened over the last week. The United Nations would officially stamp the authority of the ICC today, and their rules would become law for the whole planet. The ceremony to inaugurate the ICCC into official existence was set to take place within the hour. Paula, Fisher's wife, came into the Oval Office from the porch overlooking the Rose Garden, where Adam first came to Earth not two months ago. Silently, she walked over to his desk and started massaging his neck. After a while, she said, So tense. He lifted his arm up and affectionately touched her hand. Aren't you going to put the TV on? she asked. What for? They're about to sign that monstrosity they call the International Contact Committee into law. Yes, I know. I haven't been watching much TV. It's too depressing at the moment. She kissed the top of his head, then picked up the remote on his desk and switched on the big flat screen on the other side of the office. Fisher was right. The news channel that came up was halfway through a summary of the last fortnight's events and how they had been received around the globe. The current Pope, who had only been in office for just over a year, formerly Cardinal Delio, was the first face to appear on the President's TV screen. He was telling the news reporter how the official line from the church was that the aliens were spreading evil ideas and even suggested at one point that they might be the work of the devil. Then it was the turn of Alan Greensnade, Fisher's most likely rival for the next election. Though he would be on the Democratic ticket, he was posturing as far to the right as he could bear. He was condemning Fisher's irresponsibly liberal approach to giving potentially dangerous aliens free reign to come and go almost as they pleased over the US, and how under his government there would be tighter controls, as agreed by the UN's new ICC. The TV showed clips of the British Prime Minister shouting and banging his hand on the desk of the dispatch box in the House of Commons. The UK had ended its ceasefire on Brazil and started up the war again. Almost every country had started initiating embargoes on every other. Next, a right-wing political commentator was on, discussing the situation with a well-known left-wing commentator. They were clearly both agreeing with each other. The will of the people is more important than a few dangerous individuals, the right winger was saying as his left-leaning friend nodded in agreement. That's why I'm so glad that folks like you and me can come together and unite on this issue. You're right, John. And when you say dangerous individuals, you know the one of which, perhaps the most dangerous of all, is our current president. Yes, I agree. You know, I supported him initially, but this man Joe Fisher clearly has no idea what it means to be presidential. The TV audience watching this discussion started to clap. 
This joke of a man has allowed these aliens to do what they like, when they like. Most of them haven't even bothered going on my show or yours or speaking to the people as a whole. Even now, despite the ICCC's rulings, which will have the official seal of global approval in the next few minutes, he has had the audacity to condemn them. He actually condemns what the people want. The sooner this selfish man's term is up and he's put out to pasture, the better. The crowd started to cheer as Paula changed channels. On C-SPAN, the votes were being counted in the UN and the chairman that Fisher had argued with a couple of weeks ago got up to speak. It is unanimous, the chairman began. The leaders of the world have cast their votes and I can now declare that with just two exceptions, both the existence and the full enforcement of the International Contact Committee has been fully ratified into supranational law under Article 1492 of the United Nations. The chairman banged his gavel and Fisher could see almost every person in the UN chamber cheer. And that's how liberty dies, Fisher whispered to his wife with tears in his eyes, in a thunderous round of applause. She kissed him. She wanted to tell him that it would be okay, but like her husband, she knew that somehow, for now at least, it wouldn't be. They both noticed the Secret Service agent at once. He must have discreetly entered without them knowing, As soon as they acknowledged his presence, he spoke. Excuse me, Mr. President, but we have an issue that needs your attention. You need it in the situation room. Fisher ran down to the sit room to see Laura Palmer, his chief of staff, looking distressed. As soon as he walked into the dark room, he noted the two large screens. One was the now all-too-familiar satellite feed of the huge alien ship orbiting around the Earth. The other was of Adam, sitting behind a nondescript white background, staring into the screen. He looked serious. His relaxed, confident smile was gone. What is this? asked Fisher. Adam sent a signal to every nation about a minute ago, Mr. President, said Laura. What did the signal say? Only that on a certain broadcast channel at 3 p.m. Eastern time, he would be sending a message to the world. Fisher looked up at the clock in the sit room. It was 2.59 p.m. As soon as it turned 3 p.m., Adam started to speak. Thank you for listening to this transmission. It shall be our last for a long time. As I am no longer allowed under your new laws to speak to President Fisher personally, I thought the only legal course of action was sending a transmission out to the whole world. If that technically doesn't comply with the new law, please accept my apologies. I won't be talking for long. What's this all about? One of the military generals in the sit room asked to no one in particular. No one answered him. The governments of my planet have laws about making contact with other species and planets at the right time, Adam continued. We thought that it was the right time to make contact with Earth, but can now see that it was not. President Fisher, Joe, I'm so sorry. It might not be any consolation to you, but in generations to come, I promise that we shall try again. Take care, friend. The screen went blank. Instinctively, everyone in the Situation Room turned their heads to face the other large screen with the huge alien ship orbiting Earth. Within a few seconds, a laser blasted from the hull of the vessel, ripping a huge, brightly coloured hole into the fabric of space. Two seconds later, the ship blasted through the hole and vanished. One second after that, space went dark. It was as if nothing was ever there. Everyone stood still for a moment. Then the generals and other military officials started shouting panicked orders with an air of fear and futility. What just happened? Give me a sip rep now! Where did it go? Somebody track that ship immediately! President Joe Fisher found a seat in the corner of the Situation Room and sat down. Laura knelt down beside him. Everyone else had pretty much forgotten the Commander-in-Chief was even in the room. But Laura was there, beside him as always. Mr. President? she asked, not so much to inquire if he was okay, but almost as an appeal for answers. The president put his head in his hands. We were so close, he muttered, barely audibly to himself. So close to the next stage. We blew it. That was The Next Stage, 
Story 5 from Everything in Seven Stories, written by Andy Jones and narrated by the author. This is a Gold Pictures production. Thank you.